Okay, so we should have out our chapter two notes. I'm going to tell you this first lesson in this chapter two is a lot of history. So you really need to do a couple of things to get the most out of it. If you don't want to read sections 2.1 to 2.5 first, that's fine, but you should go back and read them or at least skim them after the lesson because I'm not going to cover everything. I'm just going to go over the highlights. And those sections 2.1 to 2.5 are found on pages 42 to 53 in the text. The second thing is, ideally, for this to make the most sense, you should go into the Chapter 2 documents in Schoology. And I have placed five video clips that are one to two minutes in length that really should be watched prior to this lesson. So you can pause me, go into Schoology, the video clips. And the reason being is because I told you I don't want to violate any copyright laws. I didn't want to embed the little video clips right into the lesson because some of them have to do with some of the experiments that I'm going to talk about. So with that being said, now would be a good time to pause and watch those video clips that are very, very short in length before continuing with the lesson. So how has atomic theory evolved? I mean, we know that it started with Democritus, the Greek, saying that the atom was a hard, indivisible sphere. And then we had experiments that were done by Dalton, Thompson, Rutherford. We're going to throw some new names out there in this unit as well. This is uh, referring, this comic strip is referring to Archimedes' principle, where the crown and the gold have equal weight, but the crown displaced more water than the gold. And this is actually um, a true story, and there was a little video clip on that, so I'm not going to ruin it. I want you to watch the video clip. But let's just say that even back in the day when you tried to scam somebody, uh, uh, you didn't get away with it. So let's talk about Dalton's atomic theory. So Dalton's atomic theory had four principles. The first one being each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. His second part of his theory said all atoms of a given element are identical. Which would mean that atoms of different elements are not identical. Third, atoms of one element can't be changed into another, into atoms of a different element by chemical means. Notice we said by chemical means, not nuclear means. And yes, I realized I put too many slides on a page. Um, I promise for the next unit I will put less slides so you have more room to write.
and compounds form when atoms of more than one element combined. And a given compound always has the same relative number and kinds of atoms. So we've talked about Dalton's theory before, but not quite in so much detail. So the law of constant composition and the law of conservation of mass lead to the law of multiple proportions. Recall in the last unit that we said the law of constant composition stated that the chemical composition of a compound is always the same. Now we have the law of conservation of mass, which states that the total mass present before and after a reaction are the same. I don't think I have to know that. I think that you've heard me say a hundred times, conservation of mass. What we start with, we must finish with. Same thing. He just said it a little bit more eloquently, saying the total mass before and after a reaction are the same. Leads us to the law of multiple proportions, which basically tells us that if two elements, say A and B, combine to form more than one compound, that the masses of B that can combine with the given mass of A are in the ratio of small whole numbers. So let's put that in layman's terms or a shorter definition. Let's see. When a compound forms the mass of one element combines with the fixed with a fixed mass of the other element resulting in ratios of whole numbers. So we kind of see that here. We have carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So we have three grams of carbon in both of these. In carbon monoxide, we have four grams of oxygen. In carbon dioxide, eight grams of oxygen. So it's a total of seven grams versus a total of 11 grams. So the ratio of oxygen to carbon is four to three and eight to three. If we look at the mass ratio of carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide, 
we can see that what's constant is the carbon, but then the ratio of oxygen in both is 2 to 1. So that's what they're talking about when we have two elements that form various compounds. Another example would be like water, which is H2O, and hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. You have the masses of one element combining with a fixed mass of the other element. In this case, the fixed mass is the carbon. In the, uh, in the example of the water and the hydrogen peroxide, the fixed mass would be the hydrogen. But we're still resulting in ratios of whole numbers. So that was the last part of Dalton's theory. So then we're going from the atom being this hard indivisible sphere to then discovering subatomic particles. And those experiments were the discovery of the electron, the mass of the electron, and the charge of electron, which took place through the works of J.J. Thompson and the cathode ray tube experiments, which you should have watched the video clip on, and Robert Melkian's oil drop experiment. And here's a picture of the cathode ray tube, and you can see as the electrons are being emitted that when they hit the electric field, the positive and negative, they're deflected from the negative and move toward the positive field. And the video, uh, the, this, is, this is the link for the comic strip that I gave you, but the um, video clip is good as well. Then we have Robert Melkian's oil drop experiment. And what he did was he dropped little small droplets of oil through a hole and he watched what happened as you had um, x-rays that discharged charge in this chamber and the oil drops picked up the charge and it affected the rate of fall. And what he found out was that the drops with more charge fell more slowly. Doing some basic math, he basically was able to determine the charge of an electron to be 1.602 times 10 to the ni negative 19 coulombs. After J.J. Thompson and Melkian's experiments, scientists had sufficient evidence to suggest that atoms were made of much smaller particles. Thompson was credited with discovering the electron. Melkian was credited with discovering the charge of the electron. And scientists and the community, or scientific community, no longer believed that atoms were solid and indivisible. Other scientists began to do experiments, and their work led to the discovery of the positive counterpart of the electron, the proton. And you should all know whose work did that. That was Ernest Rutherford. But there were some other experiments that were going on around the same time. And we didn't learn about these guys last year. William Rodigen and Henry Becquerel. William Rodigen shocked the world in it was like 1895 I believe hold on 1895 when he showed the world an x-ray of his hand it was the first time anyone had seen the inside of the body he had discovered x-rays Becquerel, on the other hand, wanted to expand on Rodigen's work with fluorescence and x-rays. And he took photographic plates wrapped in black paper with the fluorescent salts and 
he was doing experiments in Paris. He was going to expose them to sunlight, and he was going to see what happened. But the weather wasn't co cooperating. He did these in Paris. The weather wasn't cooperating, so he put the rat plates in a drawer, and several days later, he noticed, when he went to look at them, that the photographic plates were completely exposed. So he accidentally discovered radioactivity. So Becquerel, through experimentation after his accidental discovery, discovered uranium emits high energy radiation. Now Becquerel was also working with Marie Curie and her husband and Marie Curie and her husband were concentrating on discovering the source of radioactivity in a compound. So their contribution was that they'd actually discovered that it was the uranium atoms. So they isolated I'm just going to put U atoms as source of radiation. And they were jointly awarded, Becquerel, Marie Curie, and her husband, uh, Pierre, the joint Nobel Prize for discovering this. And then actually Marie, later on, I know this is off task, won a second Nobel Prize for her discovery of polonium and radium. So she was quite the talented lady. Okay. So this picture should look a little familiar. We have a lead block. We are um, emitting alpha particles from the block. And what we find is that beta particles are attracted to the positive electrode, alpha particles to the negative electrode, and gamma rays go straight through. Well, remember that beta particles are really electrons and they're negatively charged so we know negatives attracted to positive. Alpha particles are really a helium nuclei and helium nuclei are positively charged thus the attraction toward the negative electrode and we know that gamma rays have no mass or no charge therefore neutral and travel straight through. So we're up to Ernest Rutherford who further studied radioactivity and was able to come up with determining the relative charge and speed of the three types of radioactive particles. So we have alpha, oh bad drawing, which is positively charged otherwise known as 4,2-HE. We have beta, which is our electron, negatively charged, high-speed electron. And then we have gamma. which is no charge, 
neutral. And referred to as high energy light. And hopefully you watched Rutherford's gold foil experiment and you already know that there are two conclusions. I shouldn't even have to write them, but I will. So one, atom is mostly empty space. And two, dense positive charged nucleus. Okay, the charge and size of an atom are two measurements that have been quantified and then simplified for ease of use. So as I mentioned earlier, Melkian's oil drop experiment, electronic charge, is a quantity of charge and it is six one point sorry six oh two times ten to the negative nineteen coulombs so therefore we technically say that an electron has negative one point six oh two times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs and a proton has positive 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. But when we're talking in general terms we say that the charge of the electron is negative 1 and the charge of the proton is positive 1. And that is the first half of this unit which is basically the history. In the second half of the unit which is the next lesson we're going to start to talk and review um, a little bit about the modern atom, how elements are arranged in the periodic table, and chemical nomenclature. Alright, have a great weekend.